Well, hello, Ohio Valley. It's great to be in Willing, West Virginia. I tell you what, I love West Virginia. President Trump and Mike Pence, they love West Virginia. We love you. Thanks for coming. Great crowd today. I tell you what, uh, I'm a radio talk show host, but I'm also a CNN contributor going into the lion's den deep behind the blue wall. Do you all like CNN? No. You guys fired up today or what? Yeah. Hey CNN, this is what a real political revolution in America looks like. A real political revolution with tax cuts and more money in your pocket for you to decide what to do. Jobs up, prosperity up, bonuses up, consumer confidence up, wages up, small businesses up. We're making America great again. Now the liberals, led by Uncle Joe Manchin, they want their misery back. Trump Pence is making America great again. The liberals, well, we have a hashtag MAGA. Their hashtag is MAMA. Make America miserable again. So let's drain the swamp. Before we begin, our official program today, please join me in standing for our flag and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, MAGA friends. It is now my pleasure to introduce a very special person who's joining us today as our MC. As a prosecutor in the District Attorney's Office in Los Angeles and San Francisco, she cracked down on domestic violence, child abuse, murder, and drug dealers. As a legal analyst for ABC News, CNN, and Court TV, she covered the O.J. Simpson trial, John Benet Ramsey, and Michael Jackson cases, just to name a few. Now, you've probably seen her dissecting the news of the day and giving her opinion on major issues affecting all Americans as co-host of the lively 5 p.m. panel on Fox News, The Five on the Fox News Channel. And we're really excited to have her here with us today. She's been named Outstanding Woman of the Year, USO Entertainer of the Year, and she has received the Latino Star Award, among many other awards. And just this week, America First Policy's team proudly announced that she's now the Vice Chairwoman of America First. This is her debut with America First, please give a warm welcome to Kimberly Guilfoyle. Good afternoon, West Virginia. Really such an honor and a pleasure to be here. I have a great admiration for your fine state and really a pleasure to be here on behalf of America First Policies as its new vice chairwoman. So good afternoon to you and shall we begin? Yes. I want to thank John as well for that beautiful introduction and thank you all for joining us here today. 
I'm, it is my pleasure, really, to welcome you to our Tax Cuts to Put America First event, and having it here in beautiful Wheeling, West Virginia. America First Policies, in case you're unfamiliar, is a nonprofit grassroots organization supporting key policy initiatives that will work for all citizens and put America first. And of course, this is what our fine President Donald J. Trump also campaigned on, and he is, in fact, delivering results for all of us. And what we want to talk about today is what our mission is, which is we are committed to empowering, educating, and mobilizing the millions of Americans, like all of you who are here in this room, who want to make America safer, stronger, more prosperous, and greater than ever. And because, like you, we believe putting America first means fighting to stop countries like China from taking advantage of us, stealing our jobs, and dumping products here while they keep great American products out of their country. It means making sure, yes? And this is something that is so integral to our success as a country, to our economy that has been booming under the Trump economy, because it means making sure also that there are less federal regulations on the books, not more. And President Trump has been working hard, delivering, cutting less regulations, making them go out so that we can actually have a more prosperous economy and business thriving in this country, which includes fair trade deals, reciprocity with other countries and that overzealous government bureaucrats are reined in. They cannot be allowed to do what they've been doing for far too long, and that's part of the drain the swamp. And as a former prosecutor, this is one of the most important things to me, because putting America first also means putting judges in that actually uphold the Constitution, not rewriting the laws as they see fit. And it means fighting for an immigration system that meets the needs of Americans first. And guess what? Building the wall. This is why America First Policies was on the front lines fighting to make sure that Congress passed the biggest tax overhaul in a generation. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act that President Donald J. Trump signed in December has already been a huge success. We're already reaping the benefits of it. Real wages are up. Unemployment is down. Black and Hispanic unemployment is the lowest ever recorded. Manufacturing is back, and retirement accounts are stronger than ever. And we love that when we check that at the end of the month, don't we? <laughs> Show us the money, right? And we finally, exhausting, it's been exhausting, right? Eliminated Obamacare's individual mandate that was forcing Americans to buy insurance that they couldn't afford and that they did not want. But we're not done yet, are we? Are we tired of winning yet? No. I love it when you say that. <laughs> so join us, if you will, as we continue the fight. We're going to be fighting with you every day to drain the and keep you apprised of the major policy initiatives that your congressmen and your senators need to support to take our country back. Because if we keep fighting one another all day long, each and every day, we need to work together so that collectively 
in the House, in the Senate, working with our president, who works so hard every day to help each and every one of us and put money in our wallets and food on our table, we will make America great again. And we have a fantastic panel for you today, one that you are really going to enjoy. And it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator and our panel for this very important discussion about taking our country back and creating jobs in a thriving economy. Our moderator, Ian Boccaccio, principal at Ryan LLC. And for our panelists, West Virginia Governor Jim Justice. <laughs> Alfredo Ortiz, President and CEO of the Job Creators Network. Chris Miller, president of Dutch Miller Automotive. <laughs> Judy K. Shepard, president and CEO of Professional Services of America. On behalf of uh, America First Policies, we want to thank you all for joining this very special, important event today. We thank you for your support. I'm going to turn it over to our moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. This is such an exciting time. I'm the one tax guy on the panel and thus the moderator. But I can tell you, uh, from a tax perspective, we've been talking about these changes for decades. What happened on December 22nd of last year was generational. Uh, it's going to impact generations of Americans. We've been talking about how uh, our current structure just wasn't competitive. And it took the Trump administration to get done what needed to be get done. When we look back at all of the opportunities that lay ahead, the media really focused on how this was a benefit for the fat cats, perhaps the shareholders. And I think the best way to understand the impact of this tax act is really to talk with regular people. On our panel today, we have people both in business as well as public service, as well as both. And hearing the stories about what this tax act has done for us already, just seven months in, and what we think it'll do for us in the future, I think we'll all walk away from this discussion with a better understanding of how important the act really was. So what I want to do is just open us up with a question, if I could. And this isn't directed to anyone in particular, so please feel free to chime in. How were the tax cuts meant to grow our economy? Well, I'll, I'll step in on that one first. Our economy is... Uh, <clears throat> It, it's thrived on transactions. It's the exchange of dollars for goods and services from one person to another. And the more transactions that we have, the faster our economy is going to grow. And the best example I can give is, um, I employ about 250 people in West Virginia. And once the tax bill went into effect, I had several employees, and I'm not talking about one or two, I'm talking about 15, 20, who would say, hey, Chris, my, my paycheck's wrong. I think you paid me too much money. And I'd say, actually, no. Let's sit down and look at this. Um, your rates went down, your deductions went up, and also, most importantly, and this is something that's not talked about at all, your withholdings went down. And so at the end of the day, we had tons of people whose net checks were dramatically higher underneath this tax, underneath this tax cut than they were before. And that's dollars and cents that families can use to spend money inside of our economy, save money inside of our economy, not only for their benefit, but their retirement. It was huge. It, it really is tough to quantify once you factor in the uh, uh, withholdings. It, it's, this is the largest tax cut in the history of the middle class. We've never seen anything this big. And we don't hear that mantra out there right now in the news media. But it is a fact. We literally are witnessing right now the largest tax cut in the history of the middle class. Yeah. 
Let me just jump in, and I don't mean to jump in front of anyone here whatsoever, especially this beautiful lady on the end, but, uh, but let me just say this from the standpoint of selfishness for West Virginia. You know, numbers don't normally lie. And when I walked into office on the very first day, the numbers were so bleak it was unbelievable. I mean, no matter what anyone would say anywhere, the numbers were bankrupt. The numbers were nowhere to turn. Rainy day fund drained as low as it could possibly be rain, drained and our bonds being derated. Nowhere to turn. Lots and lots of problems. And a state that we all know that are here today probably is, in my opinion, the best state of all. Now, just... and without question the best people, but nevertheless, just think, just think what's happened. I mean, these things don't just happen by just rolling off the pickle truck. I mean, in all, in all honesty, things have really changed. The reddest numbers of all have some way, somehow turned black. Now, I'd love to be able to say, oh, yeah, it's all Jim. Well, it's not all Jim. Or I'd love to say, well, it's all the Republicans that have that have passed all this legislation prior to Jim and everything is just starting to roll. And all that's true. But at the end of the day, if we don't have Donald Trump and Mike Pence and the moves that have happened from a regulatory standpoint, from a tax standpoint, these numbers don't happen. And the goodness that has come to this state and now the snowball that's rolling down this hill, so much of it comes from the friendships of Donald Trump and Mike Pence and all they've done for this great country, and we best, better, dadgum well, be appreciative. So, I... I, I know, and I'll conclude by saying, I know ever so much what's happening today in West Virginia, and I am one appreciative young man. Young, did I say. <laughs> Well, Ian, if I could talk a little bit here. Um, so Job Creators Network, which is the organization that I run, really represents small business owners across the country. Actually, for those of you who obviously came in on the side there, I think you may have seen our bus on the side there, Tax Cuts Work. We've actually been going uh, around the country for the past three years. This is our third year of doing that. We started with, a, uh, with an event that's called Bring Small Businesses Back. We had one little bus there, we started. This is now our third year of promoting small businesses. Last year, we had the Tax Cuts uh, now uh, events that we were putting on across the country. This year is the Tax Cuts Work uh, events because that's exactly what we're hearing and what we're seeing is that Tax Cuts Work. So we've actually, by the end of uh, October, we will have gone about 25 different states, 50 plus stops, talking to small business owners across the country. So we couldn't be more excited about it. Um, and it's really fantastic because we get to hear what small business owners are saying. And what they're saying is this is working for them. We have a, a site called taxcutswork.com where we've collected 2,500 stories from small business owners across the country that are saying how it's working for them. And I couldn't be more excited about it. And I have to tell you, I think people in this crowd may, may remember that when the Tax Cuts and Job Act passed, there was a particular uh, person called Nancy Pelosi who said this would be Armageddon. Oh, right? Remember that? Armageddon? You mean well, the same people that were responsible for the for the largest tax right. increase from 2009 called Obamacare that's the, in the history of our country because that was a tax. Exactly, exactly. But remember this Armageddon that she described, right? That it was going to be just completely horrible for our country. Well, if lowest unemployment rates, highest raising wages, highest GDP growth in years, et cetera, et cetera, is Armageddon, sign me up for Armageddon every single day because this has been amazing. So. And just remember, you were the deplorables. That's right. And you were the ones that really the crumbs didn't matter. Well, now the crumbs are a landslide to them. So thank you. I want to add that I was in the same situation. And when the tax bill, I was, I was, I was speaking on it long before it ever got passed. And to me, it really helped my business as a small business owner of almost 30 years and having employees in the field and then being able to get more money. I had the same situation that you had with employees coming thinking their checks was, was incorrect, which it wasn't. 
and uh, one gal, you know, gets $40 more in the month, but $40 more in the month is quite a bit of money for a lot of the middle class people and what it did for them. Also, our unemployment rate was unbelievable how that went down. The other thing that we were able to do was join forces with another company that would have never happened if President Trump had not have been done this bill. By joining forces now, we're getting ready to do this public announcement on it that we're able to bring benefits for people at as low as $9 an hour to whatever the rate is at the high dollars, which is short term, long term, $100,000 worth of life insurance, and that's free to those, and we're not even charging the customer for that. Health care, and with this Obamacare going away, some of the things that we're doing is unbelievable. They're finally going to have a 401k through me that they never had before. This is what it's done for us and for the state, and it bring, we're bringing jobs more jobs to West Virginia because of this. And under the leadership of our governor, some of the things that are happening in West Virginia, I think we're just right on the cusp. I think this is going to be where everybody will want to be due to the, due to the tax bill and due to the leadership of our governor also. Yeah, there's something special just starting to happen. It really yes. is. Yeah. Very much so. Well, that's you know, fantastic stories. I'd like to focus then on what's going to happen next. And if it's just starting to happen, what can we expect? Uh, you know, our headline rate at the corporate level went from 35% to 21%. We were the highest tax um, country in the entire world from a corporate perspective. So I ask many of my clients, you know, where do you want to do business? Do you want to do it in a 21% environment or, or do you want to keep reinvesting in places like uh, uh, Mexico where it's 30% or China where it's 30%, most of Europe's mid-20s? Um, I think if you look forward, we're going to see more and more investment in this country, not just within the U.S., but inbound foreign investment to keep hiring, growing, and developing here, which I think will continue to grow. But what do you see in your businesses or, or your state governor with respect to the future? How do you see this playing out you know, going forward? Where's GDP going to end up? How is that going to impact the every person? The activity is just starting. To, it's just starting. And the opportunities are really starting to open up as well. Um, we just, we just uh, bought another business and added an additional 40 jobs. Those are 40 West Virginians, actually 43 West Virginians that are now working. Um, and part of it has to do, it's not all to do with the tax bill, but part of it has to do with that. The, op the opportunities to be able to save money to pass on to workers, to be able to expand your business is there. I mean, it's exciting to see it's, you know, really starting from the ground up. I see it also in the manufacturing in our state that we're seeing that coming back, and it's due to some of the, the regulations and not only the tax bill. I see that coming. I see, we've just invested by doing this, by do, joining forces, by doing that, we're bringing more businesses in, we're opening more offices in our state, which is great and also adding an additional software, things that you could have never afford before. So we're seeing that, and we're seeing it. I, I'm mentoring 10 other manufacturing companies in our state, and we're seeing that growth uh, for them. So I just see it as a growth pattern. I see it's just growing, and I think we've got a lot of best-kept secrets that I think will come out soon. For yeah, our state. Ian, if you could indulge me a little bit, if I could ask a question of the audience or a couple of questions. Is that okay? Please. A couple of minutes. So, so folks, a little audience participation here, if you don't mind. So I'm going to ask you, Three questions, because again, as I mentioned, Job Creators Network really is going around the country talking about small business owners, and you can hear from two of our panelists how important small business is. But I want to give you a sense and some context of how it is overall across the country. So listen and put your phones away for a second. It's three quick questions. Uh, the first question is, who here actually owns a small business or works for a small business? Please raise your hand and keep them high. Keep that for you. All right, two panelists here. All right, who here actually has a friend or keep them up, keep them up, please oh, keep I them up. To. Yep, yep, keep them up. Who here actually has a friend or a relative who works for a small business? All right, a bunch of you. The last question here is, keep them everybody, hands up high so I can see them. The last question is, who here has actually shopped a small business in the last week? So I'm talking, uh, you're the pizza guy, the dry cleaner, the, the hamburger guy. All right, so I can look, it looks like about 98% of the hands are up. So the other 2%, I don't know what you do day in and day out in your lives, <laughs> but that's really bizarre. Um, but overall, I mean, this just gives you some sense as to how important small business owners are, in, are, are to our economy here in West Virginia, here you know, across the country, and really in everyday lives, small businesses either touch your lives or you touch their lives every single day. And in fact, there are 30 million small business owners across the country that actually employ 60 million people. Almost 100 million people are dependent on the success of small business in this country. And I'm here to tell you that President Trump has done more for small businesses in this country than any president, I believe, in history to help make sure that people understand. That's right. And I'd like to actually say that the president, I think, is really the small business president. 
because when we got out three years ago, and I mentioned the Bring Small Business Back tour that we were doing, we asked small business owners across the country, what are the three things that matter the most to you that are impacting your business the most, that are keeping you up at night? And it was over-regulation, too much red tape, yes. right? Yes. It was over-taxation, taxes were way too high. In many cases, 50 right. cents of every dollar were being, were being sent back to the government, right, of hardworking business owners. And then the last one was lack of access to capital and credit. Well, I'm here to tell you he's obviously, you know, President Trump has managed the over-regulation piece, and in fact, he promised, I think, two regulations off the table for everyone introduced. Well, he, they didn't do that. They actually did 22 regulations, right, for everyone introduced. And then he also now, we know, cut taxes not only on a corporate side, like you mentioned, but on small business owners, the largest small business tax cut in 39 years, right? And then the last one was access to credit. If you remember the Dodd-Frank disaster that happened, 2,000 plus community banks went out of business because of that. And that has now gotten fixed. So really, the trifecta of fixes, and I have to tell you, our small business owners across the country couldn't be more thankful and more excited and more optimistic about their future. I'd add one more thing to that. Yeah. I'd add the impact of charitable work inside of a community. That's a great And one. we do a better job of taking care of ourselves than the government does any day of the week. Yeah. And Very true. It's the truth. And the more money that stays inside of a community, the better, the better that its citizens can do for each other. And that's one of the other things that follows right in line with what you're saying. The less tax we have to pay to the federal government, the more money that stays here for jobs, for employment, and also for good to do uh, amongst each other. One of the greatest lessons my mom ever taught me, who, her name, she, she's sitting right up front there, her name's Carol Miller. And that is you have a moral and social oblig obligation to give back to your community. And the more money that we have through reduction in taxes, the better that we can do that, the more effective we can do that. And we all take part in that. We all do that. It is our job to take care of each other. Yeah, that's right. You know, and speaking on that, we met a young lady back when we were in the holding room that is elected to stay in West Virginia to go to the University of West Virginia, where she had a wonderful college to go to. She's elected to stay here to make a difference because she feels that's what she's supposed to do. And she turned down great college, right? Yale. Yale. Yeah, she, she goes, nope, Yale, I'm staying here in West Virginia. You and, guys have a good day. And so I said, this is wonderful. This is what we want to hear because all of our people are moving away. We want to keep you here. So it's great to see somebody that's going to start her first year and be here right here in our state at WVU versus a, you know, Yale. So I was real proud of her. And, and let, me, let me jump in and say this. And this is kind of for audience participation as well. Just think about this. In this tax plan, if you buy a new piece of equipment, you have the ability, you, I mean, you have the right now to be able to write off or expense that whole piece of equipment in one year. Now think about this just and be honest with yourself. How many tractor trailers with low boys hauling a new piece of equipment do you see when you're driving now up and down the interstate? They're everywhere. They're all over the place and everything. Well, absolutely, who do we have, who should we give credit for that for, to? I mean, there is so much happening within our borders, within what we can see every day. And there's reason for all that. I've always said, you know, judge me by my deeds. Judge President Trump and Vice President Pence by their deeds. I mean, for crying out loud, get all the ground fodder out of the way. Judge them by their deeds. And let me just add one other thing. You know, I'm really close friends with Donald Trump and his family. You know, I can tell you this story, and I want to tell you this real quick. Let me tell you how good his kids are. Eric Trump came to visit me, and Eric loves the outdoors, and my bird dog had had a bunch of pups and everything, and so I said, Eric, let's go over and see, you know, my bird dog. She's got a new litter of pups and everything, and so he wanted to do that, and then, you know, we, after we did that, we ended up way back in the mountains in no man's land, and I blew the tire out on the back end of my Suburban, and we were so far away that you shouldn't have had a Suburban there. You shouldn't have really had a four-wheeler where I tore it all to pieces. <laughs> But who's underneath my vehicle changing the tire? And it was, you know, I was helping, but I wasn't underneath the vehicle. And Eric was. And I am telling you, I can speak from my heart about this. You know, Donald Trump is an incredible man, but he cares. Mike Pence is an incredible man that really cares. That's what's making all this click. For the far, far, far left, I would just say to all them, maybe not to far, 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 to the <laughs> moderately left, I would say open your eyes and open your heart 
to what is happening in America, what is happening here, and see that you don't want to join us because this is really for real. And so, again, I salute you. I salute, you know, for what our president and vice president have done. Watch for those pieces of equipment that fly by you every day, every day, more and more and more. Be happy. Well, I think the focus has been great around small business. This has helped big corporations, small business, the young, the elder, all across the board, these tax cuts have done great things. Depreciation, we're not all accountants, what does it really mean? Well, if I've got a tractor and I've got to use that, buy a new tractor, I couldn't take that deduction over five years. I spent $100 on that tractor, I couldn't take a tax deduction for five years for that tractor, whereas now, I can take that whole deduction to offset my income today, generating less tax. Further, I hear stories all the time from my friends and my family say, I don't understand how uh, these tax rates impact the small business. I hear you say it helps a small business. I understand wages are going up, but the tax rate didn't move. We individuals, if it's a pass-through, still are taxed. It's a lower rate, but it's, it's still a higher rate than the 21%. Well, put into this plan, I want to set the fact straight, is that for pass-through entities, so if you have a partnership, 20% of that income is tax-exempt effectively, lowering your rate significantly. So there are real statutory rules in this tax bill that have lowered taxes, not just for the corporations, but for the individuals who own businesses as well. Just a quick technical anecdote there I want to set straight. Well, and if I could just add again to that, I mean, our small business owners couldn't be more excited about that break. Look, could, could, could we do more? I, I still think we could do more, but it, is, it was an amazing, amazing push for small business owners and a major shot in the arm. Three years ago when I started this idea of really going on the road and talking to small business owners, people were depressed literally depressed. They were ready to leave their businesses because it was either they were being taxed too high, too much red tape, or they couldn't get credit. Those three things alone, people were ready to leave their businesses behind. I think you actually mentioned, you know, you may have been, yeah, I know, did. Sh should I leave it or not? And, and now optimism it. is sky high. It's, in fact, it's been the highest ever. But here's the scary part, Ian. All of that, all of this good, there's three people out there in DC that think this is the worst thing ever, right? Between Chuck Schumer, and Elizabeth Warren and Nancy Pelosi, right? In fact, Elizabeth Warren just yesterday on an interview said, you know what, I think those days when 50% of, you know, 50 cents of every dollar that you make needs to go back to the government, I think those were good days. Like this bizarre world, I mean, I, I just don't even understand that. All that's ready to go. These people are ready to kill that. And so that is why it's so important that we get the word out that these tax cuts are working. So a dollar in your hands Will have much great will have a much greater impact on your economy and your local economy than a dollar in the hands of the federal government every Amen. day of the week. I'm going to one up it really quickly. Taxation is theft. Very much so. Part of it. Very much so. Yeah. Well, just think about this just for a second too. You know. We mentioned the lowering of the corporate rate from 35 to 21. And that's real money to small business. That's real money to lots and lots and lots of people. We mentioned, you know, the, the, the ability to be able to write off a piece of equipment in one year. And that's real money as well. But just think for a second about the multiplier effects of all that is happening. That's what really happens. I mean, it's hard to just equate, but not only did the guy that's buying the piece of equipment get a bump, but the guy that's selling the piece of equipment gets a bump. Mm -hmm. But not only that, the guy that's hauling the piece of equipment out on the interstate gets a bump. All the reduction in, you know, your paychecks, you know, the taxes that are going in your paychecks gives you bumps. All of this has an incredible multiplier effect, and that's what makes the engine run. And, and I've got to say one other thing, and I have to say this about Dutch Miller. This is just a story. This young man asked me to tell you a story, and I'll just tell this, then I'll shut up. But my dad was playing Dutch Miller in the, in the seniors' open or the seniors' championship oh. at the Greenbrier Hotel. And they were playing, and they were on the 17th hole, and they were dead tied in match play. My dad birdied the 17th hole to go one up. 
And truly, if, if I die right this minute, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> we measured his shot on the 18th hole of par three. My dad hit first. He was one up. He hit it 19 inches from the hole. Now, the match is over, isn't it? Dutch Miller knocked it in the hole. <laughs> hole in Ty, one. Hole in, he hit a hole in one to win that tournament. Yeah, tied the match, and then they went on from that. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible story. By the way, what you've done with the Greenbrier, reinvesting in West Virginia is a fantastic thing. It does not need to go on there. Well, there's, there's lots of us, lots of us, and lots of you that are making all this happen, and that's good stuff. But you've created a lot of jobs with that. The job creation alone has been unbelievable for down there. It's just been, you have to come and visit if you've not been there. I'm encouraging these gentlemen to come. The other ones because you need to come. It's great for our state and it keeps the economy going. So it's great. Thank Special you for place. doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say come to Wheeling. It's an incredible, incredible place too. Uh, uh, this, this is one hot spot right here, and I mean it. I always enjoy coming here. My basketball team is going to play Wheeling Park up here, so I want all y'all to come there and probably watch us get our tail beat. <laughs> but, uh, but we'll get through it. But nevertheless, uh, you know, Wheeling is a, is a real, real, it's got so much potential, it's unbelievable. So lots of good stuff in this area of the world. I encourage these gentlemen to come back for the lights, right? Yeah, Wheeling absolutely. Lights. I said, this is the greatest Sounds place phenomenal. to come for the lights. It's phenomenal. So it's great for the state. Well, I got to add one more thing before you talk, young man. You just Please. be still. Floor's yours. Okay. <laughs> I got to add this too. You know, I, yesterday, I talked to I, I talked with our tourism commissioner, and uh, and she reported something again about West Virginia. It's all intermingled and tied right back to Donald Trump, Mike Pence. It's all tied there. I mean, this does not just happen falling off a log. She said our tourism rates in West Virginia are up June to June 16 percent. Wow. The national average is like 1.7. Think about what's happening. Think about how many times these great people, whether the president or the vice president, vice president have come to West Virginia. I think we should actually solicit them to become citizens of West Virginia. That's <laughs> here, here. You, you know, Ian, one of the things that's amazing is, and I'm sure you guys, since you live here, also know this, but in West Virginia, it seems like manufacturing jobs are really coming back. But across the country, remember just a handful of years ago, under the previous administration, they basically said manufacturing jobs are no longer for this country. Oh, that right? was their message they gave us. They remember? said, no, yeah, 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 don't forget about and, it. And now what are we seeing? Manufacturing Absolutely. is back. back across the country here in the state. Absolutely. Manufacturing jobs are back. And this president and vice president pulled that off. That is correct. And they're, and they're continuing to grow. I mean, yeah. in one of our counties alone in Jackson County and how much it's growing just because of our current president and vice president. Well, let's, let's jump then into regulation because I think tax reform is one important component, but I think it goes hand in hand yep. with regulation. You have a great statistic about how uh, less are put <laughs> on the books than taken away. West Virginia, especially with, with uh, the businesses we have here, how does or how have we seen so far and what do we expect to see with the reduction in regulation impact growth in business as well as jobs. Let me say one thing before we get into that real quick. <laughs> and that's this, is we're talking about manufacturing jobs and the steel industry is booming like crazy. Now you could help me with, you know, with the Vice President Pence or with the President, but uh, I'm going to ask him, wouldn't it be awful nice if we had Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel back to work? Uh. I mean, one of my companies a long time ago sold them an incredible, incredible amount of coal and uh, it put lots and lots of people to work and everything. But uh, some way, somehow, we've got to pull that off. I mean, this steel business is too hot for them not to be working. Yeah, I agree. But it's amazing. Regulation takes lots of different uh, angles as well and how it impacts us. You know, if you look at the regulation of the coal industry, how that affects the steel industry as well, and Jim will be able to attest to this, one of the tricks the EPA was doing underneath the Obama administration was they were sitting on permits. And so you'd be able to identify a mine, be able to go in there and start mining, pull out the coal. Well, one of the tactics that was given to the White, by the White House down to the EPA is 
just sit on the permit. So you'd find a mine that you could mine and have a, you'd, have a per, you'd have to get a permit for it from the EPA. They just sit on it and not acknowledge it. And so that essentially shuts it off as well. I know lots of guys that own um, coal mines that said exactly this. They were sitting on permits. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a tactic. And now all of a sudden, we're mining coal again. And the directive from the top down, from the White House down, from the Trump White House down is make it happen. Let's mine coal. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. You know, you mentioned in regulations, though. I'm not sure people even understood how big and bad regulations were uh, and why President Trump, I think, said, we got to do something about this. It was costing our economy about $1.6 trillion per year was the latest estimate that I saw under the previous administration. So imagine that, $1.6 trillion costing the economy. That's money that you could invest in jobs, investments in, in, in manufacturing and wages, and now that's all coming back. So again, I mean, when you talk about you know, think about the clean, you know, the whole clean water piece, you know, and what that was doing. I mean, where farmers were said, oh, that little piece of water there on your, that has to now be regulated by the EPA. I mean, it was so ridiculous and so onerous. And so I think the lifting of those regulations really have done a tremendous job of getting people back in terms of doing business and doing what they do best, which is really investing back in their businesses and the economy. Great. Can't you, uh, this will be short and sweet, but can't you just see one thing? Obama and all the croonies around him, did they really believe in America? No. No. You know, that's the very thing that this administration has done. They believe in us. They are unleashing us. They're believing in the greatest country on the face of this earth. That's the whole thing. There is a big difference for really and truly that if you don't believe or you want to migrate jobs out or you don't believe in industry, you don't believe in this, they've made you feel good about who you are. They've made me feel good about who I am. And unleashing us will absolutely rule the day. So, uh, I, like I said, I just can't be more thankful. As owners of businesses, where do you see wages going? I bring this up because I want to make sure we understand the impact of tax rates on wages. If you look at the numbers, Governor, numbers don't lie, is what you said. Right. Uh, up until 1990, for every time we had a corporate profit increase of, say, 1%, wages rose by more than 1%. If you fast forward over the next period up until 16, uh, when corporate wages went say up by 1%, wages only rose by 0.3%. Well, a bunch of factors are involved with that, but the biggest one is high corporate taxes in the US as well as an incentive to keep profits offshore and not reinvest in America. That's gone, that's changed, tax reform is solved for that. So knowing this and seeing what you're seeing, do you see wages continue to climb? Absolutely. I do, I do. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. I do. Uh, entry level positions, hourly positions, managerial positions, all of those wages are going up. Um, it's a competitive market out there, and um, the opportunity to make the most amount of money you've ever had as a person is there right now. It is, it's a very competitive market, and there's so much acti acti economic activity out there happening now that um, the sky's the limit. And they're, doing, they're doing sign-on bonuses, and they're doing more bonuses, and they're doing retention bonuses. And yes, I see salaries going up, and I'm always negotiating salaries because some of the stuff I do is staff hog. So I'm negotiating salaries, and, and it's amazing of where we were two years ago, a year ago, where we're at today. So somebody would, you know, and I'm talking a minimum wage job, there's, we don't even have a minimum wage I job. I don't know what that is. So it's yeah. just amazing. So it is, and the supply and demand is there. So it's there. Yeah. And I bet if you ask this audience out here how many people is out of work, you're not going to see as many people out of work as what we had in the past. There is a lot of jobs out there. You know, if, 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 I, could, if I could pass on one bit of information to the next generation coming up as well, it would be to learn a trade. Yes. Um, you know, we've convinced yeah. an entire generation of kids they got to go off to school and get a college education, and they got a degree in art history, and now they're living in their parents' basement. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm serious. And the next round, 
the next round of $70,000 a year jobs are in trades. It's learning how to be a boilermaker, a mason, a plumber, an electrician, um, auto mechanics, diesel mechanics, all of those jobs right there, they're in huge demand. So you know, if you're out there right now, it doesn't matter what you want to do, still learn a trade. Even if you want to go into finance, learn a trade. It, those, those jobs are going to be irreplaceable moving forward. You know, Ian, on, on the question of minimum wage, it's actually, it's kind of funny, it's, it's ironic actually, because President Trump and his administration have actually done more, I'm sure everybody's heard about the fight for 15, right, which the, the, the unions really are behind. He has done more to raise minimum wages and wages overall in this country than that entire 90 million plus dollars that they've invested in that campaign to, to move wages. And so, you know, people have, we've always said that, right? People who believe in free enterprise, that the free enterprise system, when it's allowed to be free and the government gets out of the way, it will work and it has worked and we see it working right now. And so um, it, it, it's really kind of uh, probably the most ironic piece of all that this president has more to, you know, people, people have to thank this president more than that particular fight. So it's been pretty amazing. And you're right on the apprenticeship programs. We have a, a, a thing called Fight for 50. Uh, which is our uh, kind of counter argument to the fight for $15 per hour. We're saying you need to fight for $50,000 per year jobs and give them the skills that they need. Which, by the way, the president just signed that executive order uh, last week on that. So We're doing the same thing with the Robert C. Byrd Institute. is doing that training, bringing the training back to get our workforce up to speed, So, which is great. Yeah. So that's exactly what we need is the trades that we talked about earlier. In the well, and you see it. You see it every day. I mean, today... In all honesty, we've had a lot of people over the years migrate out of West Virginia in order to go get employment. We want them all back. I mean, that's all there's to it. We want them all back, and our families put all back together and all that. But you see it today. Competition works so great and everything because if you had a wage that, that uh, John Doe across the street, whether it be construction, you know, pipeline or coal mine or road construction or whatever, you're competing. And as you compete, Wages go up. And you know the other thing that is absolutely stunning about this whole thing is just this. I'll bet you, I'll bet you all the whatever in the world that really at the end of the day, the owner of the business, the employer, celebrates that. Because as wages go up, he feels great about himself. He doesn't want wages to be suppressed and everything. So really and truly, all I'd say is we've got all kinds of great jobs in West Virginia, and if the world's listening and everything, all of you need to come and live in paradise and enjoy one of those great <laughs> jobs. I want to thank you all. Incredible panel, great diverse backgrounds, great stories about what's happening out there. Thank you all for coming today. Please stay seated as we await our special guest. Thank you very much for joining us. Good job. Before tax reform, Americans were paying more taxes than ever and our businesses were being taxed higher than any other nation in the industrialized world. Our self-destructive tax code cost Americans millions and millions of jobs, trillions of dollars. The tax code is so complicated that more than 90% of Americans need professional help to do their own taxes. This enormous complexity is very unfair. Even worse, jobs and companies moved overseas, wages sat stagnant, and economic growth hovered around 2%. We need a competitive tax code that creates more jobs and higher wages for Americans. It's time to give American workers the pay raise that they've been looking for for many, many years. $3.2 trillion, just think of it, in tax cuts for American families, including doubling the standard deduction and doubling the child tax credit. The typical family of four earning $75,000 will see an income tax cut of more than $2,000. This gets us better wages, bigger paychecks, a simpler tax system. This gets the American economy competitive 
in the global economy. We are going to bring at least $4 trillion back into this country, money that was frozen overseas. People see their paychecks getting bigger in February because withholding tables have adjusted to reflect their tax cuts. When businesses are keeping more of what they earn, when they can write off their expensing investment in their businesses and hire more people. The results have been bigger than anyone thought possible. AT&T plans to increase U.S. capital spending $1 billion and provide $1,000 special bonus to more than 200,000 U.S. employees, and that's because of what we did. AT&T, Bank of America, Comcast, American Airlines, Walmart, hundreds of companies are giving employees nearly $2 billion in annual bonuses and raises. Major corporations like Apple are bringing billions of dollars back home. This economy is already rolling at 3% at, at growth, which people told the president during the campaign. They laughed at him. They laughed. They said yeah. it would take years to get to 3%. Letting the American people keep more of what they earn, by letting middle-income Americans have more spending power, by, by lowering taxes on businesses large and small, that, that, that we're going to outperform those growth, uh, those growth projections. Rising wages, growing business, a booming economy. Tax reform is putting American workers first and creating a new era of prosperity for our businesses and families. After years of stagnation, recession, and hardship, America is back. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Attorney General for the State of West Virginia, Patrick Morrissey. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. It's such an honor to share a stage today with Vice President of the United States and a true friend and advocate for the Mountain State, Mike Pence. I can tell you, Vice President Pence loves West Virginia very much, and West Virginia loves Vice President Mike Pence. Now, how many people think here that President Trump and Vice President Pence are doing a great job? Well, let me tell you, President Trump and Vice President Pr Trump, Pence have delivered for the men and women of West Virginia time and time again. Tax cuts, reducing regulations, going up against illegal immigration, tackling the opiate epidemic, standing up for the unborn, protecting Second Amendment rights. The Trump-Pence agenda is working for America and for West Virginia. <laughs> Plus, they've delivered on a great Supreme Court justice in Neil Gorsuch, and Another great person will be joining the High Court soon, Judge Brett Kavanaugh. But there's so much more that we need to do to make America great again and make West Virginia great again. But those on the left, they don't want President Trump and Vice President Pence to succeed. They yell, resist obstruct, impeach, collusion. Too many liberal elites in Washington want to bring our president down because they don't share our values or respect our way of life. When President Trump and Vice President Pence wanted to cut taxes and let Americans keep more of their hard-earned money, liberal elites in Washington said no. They thought that they could spend their money better than you. When President Trump and Vice President Pence wanted to repeal the disaster of Obamacare, the soaring premiums, and the effort on the part of the Trump administration to allow you to maintain that physician-patient relationship, liberal elites in Washington said no. When President Trump and Vice President Pence stood for the sanctity of life and sought to defund abortion provider Planned Parenthood, the liberal elite said no. When President Trump and Vice President Pence wanted to build a wall, the liberal elites in Washington said no. 
and when President Trump and Vice President Pence work to make America great again, too many in Washington are hoping for their failure. We need to fight back, and we will. There's much more that needs to be done to make America great again. Mr. Vice President, the President's tax cuts were huge for West Virginia. The doubling of the standard deduction, the lowering of the rates, new growth zones that are actually going to help many of our impoverished communities in the state. But here's what's really wonderful. When more people have jobs as a result of the Trump-Pence policies, we also take another step forward against the terrible opiate epidemic that's raging in our state. Now, as everyone knows, there are many reasons for the drug abuse problem in West Virginia. But certainly, the economic challenges facing the Mountain State are an important factor. And I believe, and I know President Trump, Vice President Pence agree, that more good paying jobs will help lead to fewer opiate deaths. Now, I was very pleased to work with the Trump-Pence administration just a few weeks ago as your DEA, working with our office, completely changed the national drug quota system. And we went after one of the root causes of the drug epidemic. We're now getting rid of unneeded, diverted drugs and a system that was used to approve pills on the basis of industry want, not medical need. Mr. Vice President, with your administration's focus on tax cuts, deregulating our economy, and fighting opiate abuse, you are saving West Virginia lives and are truly making West Virginia great again. It's an honor to be here today with the Vice President, and it's now my pleasure to actually introduce the governor of the great state of West Virginia, Governor Jim Justice. Thank you very much. Okay. This feels pretty good, too. <laughs> Just think about a little guy from West Virginia having the opportunity in one month's time to introduce the President of the United States that I did on July 3rd, and now the Vice President of the United States. In one month, it's pretty good. That's all there is to it. But you all know how much I love West Virginia. There may be somebody here that loves it as much as me, but there's nobody here that loves it more. But you know what the incredible thing is? The incredible thing is the man that's just coming out in just a few seconds loves West Virginia also. He really, truly does. I've been with Donald Trump and Mike Pence in the Oval Office over and over and over. I've seen them in action. I've seen their hearts and what all they're all about. This is a great man, and it gives me an incredible honor to be able to introduce the Vice President of the United States of America, Mike Pence. It is great to be back in cold country, USA. Wild and wonderful West Virginia, where mountaineers are always free. Is that right? 
I want to thank I want to thank the governor for that very kind introduction. Thank him for his leadership. More on that in a minute. But before I get started, let me bring greetings from the man he was just talking about, and a man who loves the good people of the Mountain State, who he's actually called the absolute backbone of America, and the man that West Virginia voted to make the 45th President of the United States of America. I bring greetings from President Donald Trump. He loves West Virginia, and he sure wanted me to say hi. I'm also uh, really grateful to be joined by some great West Virginia leaders today. And I, I know you just, uh, you just heard from him. Uh, he's a farmer. As President Trump has said, he's a great businessman. He's a fighter. He's delivering results for hardworking men and women across the mountain state. Join me in a big round of applause for West Virginia's great Governor Jim Justice. Thank you, Governor, again. Thanks for your leadership and your friendship. And I want to say thanks uh, to the strong leaders in Congress from West Virginia who've been standing shoulder to shoulder with our president, putting West Virginia first. You've got a great senator in Shelley Moore Capito, and she's a great partner. We also want to thank Congressman Alex Mooney and Evan Jenkins and a friend of mine who flew out here just to be with us today and a great champion of the president's agenda, Congressman David McKinley. Thank you for your leadership and your support. And let me thank briefly one more strong Mountain State leader who's here today for all he's done for this state's coal workers, all the hardworking men and women of this state. He's a tireless leader, past, present, and future. Your attorney general and our great friend, Patrick Morrissey. Thank you for being here. And thanks for those great words from this podium today. And finally, join me in thanking our host today, America First Policies, and also Join me in thanking the MC of today's event, who's been a great champion of the President's MAGA agenda, Kimberly Guilfoyle. Where is she? Is she still in the house? Really great to be with you all. It's great to be back in West Virginia. You know, last week marked 18 months, a year and a half total, since President Trump and I raised our right hands and took the oath of office at that inauguration in January of 2017. And I think you look back on this last 18 months, there's only one way you can sum it all up. It's been 18 months of action. It's been 18 months of results. It's been 18 months of promises made and promises kept. And we're just getting started, West Virginia. It's true. I mean, think about it. I mean, think about it for a minute. President Trump promised to rebuild our military and restore the arsenal of democracy. With the strong support of West Virginia's conservative leaders in the Congress earlier this year, President Donald Trump signed the largest increase in our national defense since the days of Ronald Reagan. We did it. I'll tell you, under this commander-in-chief, with this strong Republican majority in the Congress, we are once again giving our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guard the resources and the training that they need and deserve to accomplish their mission and come home safe. We're doing it. We're doing it. And I got to tell you, I couldn't be more proud couldn't be more proud to serve alongside a president who cares so deeply about the men and women of our armed forces and the men and women who've worn the uniform of the United States of America. This president has fought for our veterans. Like no other president in my lifetime, he's brought about reforms and accountability to the VA, and now we have finally given veterans access to the real-time, world-class health care that you earned 
in the uniform of the United States. Veterans' choice has arrived. You know, before I go any further, I see more than a few veterans in the audience. Would you all, if you're able, would you just stand up if you've worn the uniform of the United States and allow us to thank you one more time for serving this great country? Thank you. Thank you for your service. It's about supporting those who've been defending our freedom, defending our country past and present and future. But here at home, President Trump also promised to enforce our laws and secure our borders from the first day of this administration. I'm proud to say this president has been giving law enforcement at every level the resources and the respect that our law enforcement community deserves every day. You know, there's a lot of members of law enforcement at this event today. They tend to be around a lot when I'm in. <laughs> and God bless every one of them. You know, it's been a tough couple of years in law enforcement. Seems like people in public life are too often willing to blame the people on the thin blue line first when things go wrong. Now, we believe in accountability and the public's right to know, but would you all mind getting on your feet and just showing all these law enforcement officers how much we appreciate the sacrifices that they and their families make to defend our families? God bless them all. Thanks, everybody. Now, this president stood without apology for the men and women who serve in law enforcement at every level. And by the way, that includes the dedicated and courageous public servants of the United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. Let me tell you, the men and women of ICE are remarkable law enforcement officers. And while there's actually some liberal politicians in Washington, D.C. and around the country that are actually calling, calling for us to abolish ICE, let me tell you, the men and women of ICE deserve the support of every American. They will always have the support of this administration. And under President Donald Trump, we will never abolish ICE. I promise you. And with that renewed commitment to immigration enforcement, President Trump has also been working with this Congress, and he actually signed the largest increase in border security in nearly 10 years. And we got a down payment, and we've already started to build that wall on the southern border of the United States. Oh, we're building it. So it's promises made and promises kept. But this president also promised to appoint strong conservatives to our federal courts at every level. It was just about a week ago that the president set a record for the most Court of Appeals judges confirmed in the first two years of any administration in American history, and they're all conservatives, and that doesn't even count Justice Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court or the next justice to the Supreme Court, Judge Brett Kavanaugh. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Let me say a word. Judge Kavanaugh is a man of integrity and principle. He has a proven record of support for limited government, for our Second Amendment, and for religious liberty. And Judge Brett Kavanaugh deserves the support of every member of the United States Senate. So it's promises made and promises kept. What brings us here today is this president made one promise in particular. 
And it was a promise to get this economy moving again. You know, it's amazing to think during the last eight years of the last administration, the most powerful economy in the history of the world never grew by more than 2%. It's incredible. But I can tell you since the very first day of this administration, and actually since the morning after the election, President Trump has been working to get this economy moving again. And if you haven't noticed, confidence is back. Jobs are coming back. In a word, America is back, and we're just getting started, West Virginia. And it's not just happened by accident, I'm here to tell you. We've been working it with this president's leadership. He promised to roll back the heavy hand of government. In fact, I'm proud to report to you, President Trump has signed more laws repealing federal regulations than any president in American history. We are cutting red tape at a record pace. We promised to unleash American energy right out of the gate. President Trump approved the Keystone and Dakota pipelines. We rolled back the Clean Power Plan, and President Trump put America first when he withdrew the United States from the job-killing Paris Climate Accord. And if you haven't noticed, Trump digs coal. And under this administration, the war on coal is over. We're developing all the resources of our land and calling forth its power, and it's driving this growing American economy. Thanks to these actions, the leadership of our president, and frankly, the strong efforts of your great Attorney General, Pat Morrissey, I'm happy to report to you that in 2017, Coal production in the Mountain State jumped by over 16% compared to the previous year. Coal is coming back right here in the heartland of America. That's promises made and promises kept. Another thing this president promised to confront countries that frankly have been taking advantage of America and the American economy for far too long on trade. This president took decisive action to defend our lumber industries, our steel and aluminum industries, the backbone of our economy and our security. And this president also promised to deliver for America's farmers just like they deliver for us every day. And just yesterday, in case you hadn't seen the newspaper, the president announced that because of the strong steps that he has taken, the European Union has agreed to work together toward zero tariffs, zero non-tariff, barriers, zero subsidies on non-auto goods, and they're going to start buying a whole lot of soybeans right away. That's real results. And I promise you, in this administration, this White House, this president, we're always going to fight for trade that's free and fair and works for American workers and American jobs. But finally, what brings us all here today is this president promised back on the campaign trail in 2016 that if elected, we were going to cut taxes across the board for working families and businesses large and small. And right before Christmas, and it was right before Christmas, he kept that promise when President Trump signed the largest tax cuts and tax reform in American history. That's promises made and promises kept. You know, we cut taxes for working families. The typical family of four here in West Virginia, we think is going to save nearly $2,000 a year on their taxes once they fully these tax cuts take effect. We cut taxes for businesses large and small so the companies here in West Virginia can compete and win and create jobs against companies anywhere in the world.
We also repealed the death tax for nearly every American family farmer so the family farm can stay right where it belongs in the American family. And by the way, when we cut taxes, we also cut out the core of Obamacare. The individual mandate is gone. It's off the books. And frankly, we've been able to do all of this because of the strong support of Republican majorities in the Congress and West Virginia's strong conservative leaders. But the people of West Virginia deserve to know everything that I just described to you, everything that we've been able to accomplish has been done in the face of unprecedented obstruction by Democrats in Washington, D.C. And frankly, we've done it all despite the consistent opposition of Senator Chuck Schumer and your Senator, Joe Manchin. You know, last year, Joe Manchin said that he, quote, believed in tax cuts. But when he actually had the opportunity to vote to cut your taxes, Joe voted no. When the time came to cut taxes on West Virginia's farmers and energy producers and businesses large and small, Joe voted no. And it's not just tax cuts. When the time came to cut federal red tape for West Virginia's job creators to repeal and replace Obamacare, even when the time came to give states like West Virginia the authority to defund Planned Parenthood, Joe voted no. The truth is Joe Manchin just doesn't represent the values the people of West Virginia cherish most. But it's a pretty long list. When it came to that wall we were just talking about a minute ago to secure the southern border, Senator Joe Manchin actually told the people of West Virginia, I'm not voting for the wall either. You know, President Trump was right when he said West Virginia isn't getting any help right now with Joe Manchin. Because as the president said, he just about vote against everything. But the truth is, Senator Joe Manchin hadn't supported the president's agenda. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I think West Virginia deserves better. I think West Virginia deserves a senator who will stand with this president and fight for the priorities of the people of West Virginia every single day. You know, the good news is, despite opposition from people like Joe Manchin, we've still been delivering for West Virginia. The results have been amazing. I mean, think about it. Since Election Day 2016, businesses large and small have created nearly 3.7 million new jobs. Since Inauguration Day, we've seen 5,700 new jobs created right here in the Mountain State. Last week, nationwide unemployment claims hit a nearly 50-year low. I mean, it really is incredible to think about it. You know, there, there are more job openings in America today than there are Americans looking for jobs today. That's what winning looks like, West Virginia. And the President and I couldn't be more proud that because of the agenda that you all have supported and the leadership that you all have supported, we have set a new record, the lowest unemployment ever recorded for African Americans and Hispanic Americans. The American dream is working again for every American. You know, as you know, Senator Joe Manchin, as I mentioned before, said cutting taxes for working families and businesses was, quote, not good for West Virginia. But I think the people of West Virginia know better. Since our president signed our historic tax cuts into law, more than six million Americans have actually received bonuses, pay raises, or bigger benefits, including more than 14,800 workers right here in West Virginia. In White Sulphur Springs, Worldwide Equipment is using more than $8 million of its tax cut savings to grow its operation. It's already given a bonus to every single one of its more than 1,100 employees. 
West Virginia's own DOS Enterprises announced plans to hire at least 30 new workers, thanks to our tax cuts. And I just heard that Walmart handed out $5 million in bonuses to 12,000 employees across West Virginia. Let's just hear it for all these great companies that are investing. You know, we've been able to get all this done because of your support, your steadfast support since Election Day, and your steadfast support of the leaders who've been standing with us, people like Senator Capito, Congressman McKinley, Mooney, and Jenkins. And we've all done it, I'm here to tell you, with the unwavering support of West Virginia's great attorney, General Patrick Morrissey. And I want to thank you, General. You know, Patrick Morrissey is a principled conservative who the President and I both know embodies West Virginia values, fights every day for West Virginia's working families. As your Attorney General, Patrick Morrissey led the fight all the way to the Supreme Court to stop the Clean Power Plan and defend West Virginia's coal miners and energy producers. I think that deserves a round of applause. And your Attorney General has been standing shoulder to shoulder with our President to crack down on sanctuary cities, and he's a tireless champion of all the God-given liberties enshrined in our Constitution, including the Second Amendment and the Bill of Rights. He's a proven leader. He's dedicated to fighting for conservative policies and principles, and I don't know about the rest of you, but I think we could use a conservative fighter like Patrick Morrissey in Washington, D.C. You know, the truth is, because of the support of great leaders like this, the American people are more optimistic today than they've been in many years. Consumer confidence has hit a 17-year high. Small business confidence is setting historic records. And manufacturers have never been this confident. Americans are standing tall in the world again. Can you feel it? I mean, we're proud again. The pride is back in America. We're waving that flag, and we're standing for that national anthem. I feel it. You know, I read all my mail. I get a fair amount of mail, and I like to read through a stack of it. I read a meaningful letter the other day. Somebody just wrote to me and said, I just want to thank the President and you all for everything you're doing for the country. He said, up here in my small town in Michigan, I have noticed a distinct increase in the number of American flags being displayed on my hometown Main Street. And it just touched my heart. It touched my heart. I mean, you do feel that pride is back. I mean, I, I, as I stand before you today, I really do believe that faith in America is rising. Faith in our ideals. Faith in our future. In that confident belief that our children's future and our children's opportunities are even going to be better than our own. That's that core American ideal that some of the pollsters told us was starting to fade in recent years. People were starting to tell the experts that they weren't really sure that their kids were going to have all the same opportunities that they had. And I really think that's starting to change. So I want to leave you here today based on that confidence and enthusiasm with a little bit of a challenge. First and foremost, West Virginia, keep, keep standing with all the great leaders that we've talked about here today. Keep standing with all the courageous men and women at the state and federal level who've been standing with this president. From your governor to your attorney general, Senator Capito and these great congressmen. They're doing a great job for West Virginia, and they're standing for an agenda that's moving the state forward. But secondly, after you keep standing with and for all these good people, I want you to make sure in this pivotal year of 2018 to let your voice be heard. I mean, you know, leave here today and Talk about what you heard from this great panel 
And wasn't that a great panel that we had up here today? Can you give them another round of applause? I mean, go talk to your family and your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. Talk to people at worship, at work, about, about the agenda that you've supported, the leaders you've supported, and how it's turning this country around. You know, I'll always believe that all the talking heads on television, all the TV and radio commercials in the world, all the mail, all the internet websites are not to be compared when someone who knows you and trusts you hears from you about an issue of importance to their family, their community, their state, and our nation. So I encourage you to leave here today and, you know, just stop your friends. Stop your friends, you know, outside worship this weekend, outside a grocery store, backyard fence. Pop into De Carlo's Pizza. <laughs> or go by Coleman's Fish Market and say, I ran into Mike. I ran into Mike the other day in Wheeling. And I heard this great panel. And, and just tell him, you know, it, it took Mike the better part of a half hour just to go through the top lines of everything that we've been able to accomplish as a nation in just 18 months. I mean, basically, you know, tell them, tell them what's happening. Tell them all the great things that are happening in this country about a stronger, more prosperous America. I mean, tell them what they don't hear on most of their major cable news networks every day. Right? How about that? There you go. I mean, here's the thing, West Virginia. Tell them we cut their taxes, all right, so they can keep more of what they are. Because we did. I mean, tell them we're restoring American strength at home and abroad. We're supporting our soldiers. We're supporting law enforcement so their, their safety and security is met and our freedom is secured. Go tell them. Here's the thing. Tell them we're putting Washington back to work for them instead of the other way around. In West Virginia, here's the thing. Tell them under President Donald Trump, the forgotten men and women are forgotten no more. You get out after today, you tell them that. Because it's the God's honest truth. And just tell them, tell them you sense that faith in America is rising, that you feel it with the leadership of this president, confident leadership he provides, and the strong support that we get from conservatives in West Virginia. Talk to him about that. You know, sometimes I like to say that America might just be the second greatest story ever told. So on that count, let me, uh, let me mention another kind of faith. Not only do I think that faith in America is rising, but I think, and I sense every day, that faith is rising in America once again. I really do. I sense it. I sense it. And I got to tell you, I see it, I feel it, I hear it everywhere it goes. In Montana yesterday, I was in North Dakota. The president's out in Iowa today. I can tell you the sweetest words we ever hear. And we hear them a lot. Or when people will reach out and grab a hand and just say, I'm praying for you. And it means a word. For all of you that are so inclined, I just encourage you to turn that attention to all of America. You know, in these challenging times, I truly believe, as the ancient words were inscribed so long ago, words Americans have clung to in much more challenging times than we could even imagine, are still true today. That if his people, who are called by his name, will humble themselves and pray, he'll, he'll do like he's always done, through the long and storied history of this great nation.
he'll hear from heaven and he'll heal this land, this one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So pray for America, because prayer makes a difference. So thank you all for coming out today. I'm really, I'm really very humbled by it. I'm very grateful. Governor, thank you for that warm hospitality and thank all these great leaders who are out with us today. I have to tell you, for this small town boy from southern Indiana, um, it is the greatest honor of my life to serve as your vice president. And West Virginia, I want to thank you. Thank you for the privilege to serve. And on that, I'm really grateful you'd come out today. I look forward to meeting as many of you as time permits before I head back to Washington, D.C. But I got to tell you, I leave here like I always do when I come to West Virginia with renewed confidence and enthusiasm to be among you great people. privilege. And I say with confidence, with the continued strong support of the hardworking people of West Virginia, with the support of your great conservative leaders in Washington, D.C. and at the State House, with President Donald Trump in the White House, and with God's help, Amen. I know we will make America safe again. We will make America prosperous again, and to borrow a phrase, we will make America great again. Thank you, West Virginia. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. There she stood.